Well, welcome to yet another Fusong webinar, everybody. And thanks for spending some time on a Thursday afternoon. Thanks, Ben, for coming and joining us for basically part two and continuing the conversation from last time. For those of you who didn't have a chance to join two weeks ago, we were talking about Binance and the recently issued Binance stock tokens and talking a bit about how, well, quite frankly, I don't think most of us like them. Uh, I really like the idea they're going for, which is bridging traditional and digital uh, finance and allowing people from the digital and crypto world to be able to buy into traditional securities. Unfortunately, I think we think that the format wasn't quite right. That if you are going to pitch something as an actual stock, that you, people really should become shareholders of that company and that offering them a complex derivative however it may be structured, is just a little bit messy, especially if end customers and retail investors aren't fully aware of what they're getting themselves into. And that's why I think uh, this week, we wanted to follow up with part two, so to speak. We talked about one extreme, which is tokens that may or may not be backed by anything. And today we wanna to talk a bit about Coinbase's listing. Um, Coinbase's direct listing onto NASDAQ, I think was a seminal moment in the crypto industry and something that a lot of people were pointing to as a point at which crypto would become legitimized in a sense. And I remember in, in, the, in the days and weeks before the Coinbase listing, there was a huge amount of hype going on about, wow, this is going to be a watershed moment. Uh, lots of people were talking about Coinbase's valuation, which had skyrocketed in the Nasdaq private market to well over $100 billion in terms of market cap. They were trading on some crypto derivative exchanges like FTX in the pre-market at as high as $140 billion valuation. And I think a lot of that interest was really built on the narrative of once we list on a traditional exchange like Nasdaq, a flood of retail investors are going to pile into Coinbase stock because this is the first time they can really buy into both Coinbase as a company and buy into a crypto exchange of substantive size. And for a variety of reasons, that just didn't happen. And I think that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, why that didn't happen and why, in my personal belief, Nasdaq listed in the wrong place. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to kick off with, Stella. Uh, I have a different view from Henry, mm -hmm. so uh, let's uh, let's listen to maybe Ben first before <laughs> sure. before I come in as uh, the bad guy or like the <laughs> devil's advocate. Absolutely. Um, so, what do you think we can glean from you know uh, you know precedents? Uh, look at looking at Binance and let's say Coinbase. I'm personally a little bit uh, more optimistic on Binance compared to Coinbase. For mm -hmm. one. Uh, uh, the founder, uh, CZ, for instance, um, has skin in the game, for, uh, for, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one, one reason I'm a little bit more positive on mm -hmm. uh, Binance compared to Coinbase. Um, ben, what do you think? I think at the end of the day, it really boils down to the nature of what is trying to be achieved. I, I look at the Coinbase listing as kind of here we are trying to legitimize our offering and give our stakeholders a chance to become shareholders in the company. But I think the process by which it was done was pretty inefficient. And you have what is fundamentally a crypto exchange that challenges so many of the ideals of fiat, which yeah. needs to then rely on traditional fiat markets to get its listing done. So no one has really spoken about this. It just is quite bizarre. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about my perspectives and more details we go through, but particularly from a user journey perspective, what a what a shit show in my view. Yeah, yeah I couldn't agree more. And you know, like I said, I, I unlike the Binance stock tokens, which I think are borderline illegal, quite frankly. Nasdaq, Coinbase obviously went through all the proper regulatory hoops when listing on Nasdaq, but it's just a bit strange, a bit unnatural, as I like to call it. You know, Coinbase's tagline in the early days was, we want to be the Nasdaq of crypto. And the entire pitch to their 56 million retail customers is come join the next evolution of financial markets, buy into these digital tokens and use us, Coinbase, as an interface that allows you to do it directly. 
B2C, as I call it, cutting out all the traditional layers and layers of intermediaries in the financial markets, come access our platform directly, come own and trade crypto directly. And I think a lot of people who buy crypto, they come precisely because of those reasons. They like the direct market access. They like the idea that they're somehow accessing an asset class without having to go through legacy financial infrastructure. And exactly as you say, Ben, to then turn around and say, oh, by the way, we're now doing a listing on a traditional exchange using paper-based shares. And if you want to buy our stock, either go to a traditional broker, fit in a bunch of paper forms, or go talk to one of our competitors like Robinhood, and then you can use them to buy our stock. It's just a very jarring customer experience. And I think it's a very interesting thought experiment to think about what if Coinbase could have listed in such a fashion where they can offer their own shares in digitalized format as a digital security to their own customers, to their 56 million users and said, hey, using our app, you can buy Bitcoin and you can buy Coinbase shares. I'm willing to bet that for better or for worse, their share price would be substantively higher, much closer to what I was trading at in the sort of the crypto world. And I think an interesting example to compare them to is Binance has issued their own exchange token, BNB. Now, this is, as they say on the tin, um, it doesn't represent any legal or contractual rights, doesn't represent anything directly. It's not backed by anything. Uh, you know, they, they have various mechanisms to try and create value into that token. But still, Binance, if they wanted to, could cancel it and start with BNB version 2 tomorrow and no one could say anything. And yet, because BNB is offered on the Binance exchange to their own customers, their own stakeholders, it is worth more than what Coinbase is worth. And depending on the time, it's been worth as much as double what Coinbase's entire equity has been worth. And that's why I think companies, especially if you are a digital economy company, or in particular, if you're a crypto company, or you're someone whose entire business model is based around blockchain-based assets as the future of financial markets, you yourself need to eat your own cooking and you need to be listing your own shares, your own equity, your own instruments in that exact same format and accessing your own customer base. Uh, just to add a little bit to what Henry is saying, it's not just about um, the user friction, you know, asking your customers to go on a brokerage account, for example, say Robinhood, for them to open an account in order for them to access uh, the direct listing of Coinbase. Also, one thing, the appetite for Coinbase, uh, the Coinbase listing may have just eased by just going to the traditional markets. Now, if you think for, for a moment, when uh, Coinbase was trading on the um, private digital markets, FTX, it was maybe, what, two or two and a half times its you know current valuations now they were actually losing a they could possibly be losing a significant chunk of those hardcore crypto believers, uh, people who believe in blockchain, people who were passionate enough to trade them on you know, the private digital markets, set, say like crypto uh, forward swaps, for instance, or FTX. So by telling these people to say, hey, please go to the um, you know, traditional NASDAQ markets, it's, 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 it's sort of like being a sellout in a way. Uh, we were, you know, like these crypto outsiders, uh, crypto, uh, you know, these outsiders to the traditional market and say, hey, we're joining the, you know, mainstream party. Why don't you go and join the mainstream party as well? Mm -hmm. So these people who are, you know, still, you know, the weirdos, the outsiders in a way, they feel like, why should I go open up another brokerage account that I so hate? I am here because I want to open a trusted private digital account with you, Coinbase. And now you're telling me to go on the you know, like a traditional public market at the same time. So they may have lost out on a, a significant chunk of their, you know, uh, you know, you know, staunch uh, uh, Bitcoin Absolutely. crypto believers. Yeah. Well, why do you think they did it then, Stella? Why would they list on Nasdaq in the first place? So in finance, we all know there's a there's a very common uh, phrase. It's called skin in the game. Mm. Now, this is what I need to talk about. Uh, Binance, for instance. So in many interviews like we can glean, for example, the founder and CEO, uh, CZ, as he's known, has, you know, repeatedly said that, you know, like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I want to stay invested in crypto. I want to hoard. I want to hodl. I want to keep crypto. And that's what we commonly, you know, refer to as, you know, skin in the game. He wants to stay invested. And the same can't be said for Coinbase. So if you look uh, at the uh, Coinbase early investors, including uh, its management board, for instance, more than 20% of their holdings have actually been sold off in the days, uh, not even days, like in, in the two or three days 
uh, following th its direct listing. So just as an instance, uh, uh, a red flag should be its CFO selling virtually every single one of her holdings to cash out <laughs> to somebody else uh, that you know is going to buy it. At maybe she doesn't. Maybe, maybe they don't really care about the valuations because it's a way for them to exit. It's uh, mm -hmm. the fastest way for them to exit. Keeping in mind that also that um, the direct listing is not an IPO. So they don't have a, you know, a holding period for them to, uh, a certain holding period for them to, you know, release, uh, re release their shareholdings, for instance. So they are not raising new cash. They are not, uh, uh, you know, ish, ish, raising new cash. They're not, you know, releasing a new, new equity, for instance. They're just selling whatever that's, uh, that, that they have. So that's the most direct way to actually cash out. Yeah. And I think the CEO's uh, decision to liquidate every single one of her, like virtually all her holdings is very telling in who is, who has skin in the game. Absolutely. And and own name names, I popped some people involved in that listing deal. And they said that there was a huge amount of pressure from some of the institutional backers of Coinbase to do a direct listing as opposed to an IPO to avoid the six month lockup period so that they could sell immediately and on day one. But I think that speaks to what you're talking about in terms of skin in the game and alignment. Right? Do people actually believe in what they say they are doing? Not just in terms of do I still hold equity, but I think when customers look at Coinbase listing using paper shares on NASDAQ, it just strikes them as if you don't really believe in your own business model. You say crypto is the future, where's yours? And I see this a lot in our industry. I see you know, various crypto companies on one hand issuing tokens to their retail customers and on the other hand going around and selling equity to venture capital firms you know two very different things uh, and i'm always a bit surprised by that uh, ben how do you think this is all going to evolve as a result do you think more and more companies are going to start looking at issuing digital securities do you think what do you think are some of the considerations around people in the crypto industry and also just what i call digital economy companies more broadly mm. Yeah, I mean, just to reinforce the last point, it's very, very true. I mean, one of the most telling, <laughs> telling, I guess, after effects of this listing was just looking how much the Coinbase share price plummeted, right? I mean, why? I, and I, if you look at, I don't know the final number, but probably lost around half of its value. Yeah. Um, if you look at the broader crypto ecosystem, there's been a little bit of skittishness over the past few weeks. But I would say Coinbase among Coinbase NASDAQ listed stock among all of the cryptos out there probably took the biggest hit. Yeah. And it's very, very telling in terms of saying to the to the broader market and ecosystem, uh, there's questionable value about why this was done. To go to one of the points you were mentioning earlier on was why doesn't Coinbase get to a point where they can list their own security token on their own exchange or even their own utility token. Um, you give the example of Binance coin. There's also Huobi token. There's quite a few other exchanges that have gone down this route. And the whole idea of listing these tokens, they're not an actual security, but they do give you benefits such as discounts on exchange, uh, other you know partner stores or things where you can use your utility token uh, as part of an ecosystem play. Uh, but I genuinely am very bullish on where I think the security token space will evolve. Um, the bottom line is you're seeing all the, I mentioned this two weeks ago, all of the regulatory arbitrage windows are closing down. A lot of people are starting to understand that you have to go fully regulated to market. The pathway that uh, Binance has been kind of touting uh, the other week with Binance coin seems really dodgy as we discussed. And then the pathway that Coinbase has taken seems really hyper inefficient and counterintuitive. So you need to stay within that ecosystem. I think there is a question around, oh, it attracts more liquidity. If we go to NASDAQ, we get more legitimacy, a rubber stamp, but it kind of defeats the purpose because there are two systems that in many ways uh, confront each other or challenge each other. One is hyper intermediated very inefficient, lots of fees being taken out at every step. The other one is a seamless, will face off with you as a direct user experience. Um, what I'm hoping to see is that instead of just pure utility tokens or pure security tokens evolving, why can't we have what is called a mesh of these digital shares that give you 
the capacity to use your shares in a way as a system stakeholder to get the same benefits and discount, but also some of the, you know, uh, I would say the financial uh, rights and protections that you would be afforded uh, with a traditional security. So I do think, uh, you know, the ecosystem should mature in a very healthy way. I, you know, I can run through all the benefits of why tokenize, right? It's you, you basically disintermediate the trading life cycle. You should be able to issue and go to market at a much lower cost. Um, you don't need to go through brokers. There's make or take a fees that you need to pay, which are significantly lower than many of the brokerage fees in the market. Clearing and settlement instead of your T plus two cycles, it's instantaneous on, on the back end. All the operational efficiency associated with the smart contract usage. I mean, like I can rattle off one after another the reasons why this would make far more sense. I just think the industry is starting to get their heads around how to do it. I don't think it's that it's not it's not attractive. It's just an education process in terms of how to go from uh, B where we are now to uh, F. <laughs> Absolutely, couldn't agree more. And by the way, before we continue. I um, just want to say for all of you listening on in on the call, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Or actually, what I would prefer is if you raise your virtual hand and you're willing to show up on camera, one of the team will actually pull you into this panel and you'll be able to ask your question live. We'll be able to see you face to face. But yeah, if not, go ahead and type some of those questions out in the chat. Um, but I couldn't agree more, Ben, you know, with I, I think that the, the, the narrative a lot of people had about the excitement for the Coinbase listing. And keep in mind that when they were trading on the Nasdaq private market, these were insiders selling yeah. shares to people who were outsiders, new investors coming into the company, willing buyer, willing seller, transacting at a phenomenal price. And obviously the people coming in and buying it, and these were institutions coming in and buying those shares on the Nasdaq private market at a $100 billion valuation saw significant upside. And again, the narrative I think a lot of people had is retail investors are all sitting in traditional markets. They're going to flood in the minute that Coinbase gets listed. And that proved to not be true. And Coinbase actually got significantly lower retail interest than a lot of other SaaS or technology companies like even Deliveroo's massively failed. It actually day. underperformed uh, yeah. certain benchmarks. It actually yeah. underperformed even the general S&P 500 benchmark yep. in a certain period. So Absolutely. I think that's telling. So the interest in crypto in general, whether it's uh, whether it's retail, whether it's institutional, mm -hmm. is not as high as it, you know, what, mm -hmm. you know, enthusiasts uh, actually mm -hmm. do believe. Um, some people are still uh, cognizant about uh, managing and holding their keys, losing them, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, question about say custody as another one mm -hmm. and whether you know the you know regulatory authorities are you know uh you know will be kind to them so for example in the us we don't see a lot of regulation a lot of uh friend uh, crypto friendly regulations such as in canada or even let's say in china whereby uh you know reg the reg yeah. regulatory authorities are just saying like basically no yeah. you can't you can't but we don't really welcome anything other than you know central bank digital securities their yeah. own bcep for instance yeah. so there's still hesitation in the market mm -hmm. and you know it's too early to tell if you know if the man on the street is mm -hmm. You know, bullish about Bitcoin. I think a recent study showed that up to eighteen percent of people have never heard of cryptocurrencies, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, so I think the market is really getting ahead of itself. Absolutely, and I think that more and more people are starting to ask questions around, well, what exactly am I buying, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I think a lot of people got into crypto because they're very excited about the technology and its potential. I think, I think everybody, all of us here, and I assume a lot of people on the call today are interested in crypto and blockchain-based assets because they can see that how things are done today is not very efficient. The problem is not the technology. The problem is the kind of assets that are out there today. But to be perfectly honest, my view is that the vast majority of cryptocurrency projects out there are borderline scams in the sense that they've never launched anything, they've never done anything for real, and it's not entirely clear when you buy a token what exactly you're getting. And again, just to be clear, you know, I agree exactly what Ben says, which is the idea of using these tokens to power what I call alternate value networks is fascinating. And I think that the, you know, the proof is in the pudding where you look at the, the immense surge in value of all these ICOs, I call them what utility tokens. 
But if you can take those same utility tokens of all of your tenant value and layer them on top of real securities, shares, bonds, et cetera, where investors have both a value anchor and they also have a lot of clarity about what am I getting? They have, they have certainty that a company can't just decide really they need to cancel this tomorrow and start over as lots of crypto companies do. Then I think you've got something quite magical and something that I like to call a super token where you marry both real security value and real equity with that utility value. And then you start to get all the benefits of the blockchain tech with all of the legal and regulatory certainty and clarity around securities. Because I don't think there's anything wrong with the concept of a share or a bond, right? There's nothing legally problematic with it. The problem is the paperwork and the layers and layers of intermediaries required to process all of those shares. Including, you know, a lot of people will say, hey, it's super easy to buy shares today. You go on Robinhood and it's free. And as we've talked about before, Ben, nothing in this world is free. And actually, that's the highest <laughs> transactional cost. You trade on Robinhood, you're paying 1%, 2% execution costs. And so a lot of people, I think, can see the benefit of digital tokens. And what they're waiting for now is saying, where are the actual things that I really want to invest into? I want to look at the underlying companies and assets. I want to be able to value these things. And I want to be able to look at the technology just as a way to give me better access, better clarity, and make these things easier to trade. Fully agree. Fully agree. I mean, I, one question I want to ask is: Did, did anyone here uh, kind of get into get into uh, what? Does anyone here own any Binance tokens, or did anyone in this uh, webinar? Uh, get into the listing for Coinbase? What wants to Raise your hand. Speak out. <laughs> All people would be nervous. Uh, yeah, like one of the things I'm trying to work out is because you have this, it's more it, like a lot of it boils down to the investor psyche and mindset. Like you have a spectrum of different people out there. Uh, sometimes when I meet crypto fanatics, they, they frighten me. They're really scary human beings like they're so intensely focused on crypto that they think everything else is garbage they don't want to touch traditional stocks they don't want to go into that end of the market what this is saying is among 56 million people that are punting on a market that has no link back to fundamentals that telling them to think about fundamentals and maybe buy into a company that loses the appeal um because there is always an anchor point of valuation, <laughs> whereas in utility tokens or general open market, there is no anchor point anymore. So people can't ever, you can't ever say this is overvalued or undervalued. It's just what you can tout in the market to push up or down the price of your token. I mean, we've seen Elon Musk play around with this uh, social media lever for quite some time. Uh, this guy has the power to move markets and make a fortune each and every time he places a tweet in the market. But I'm wondering if whether that in any way has an effect on the mindset of the people who are trading in this ecosystem and what they fundamentally like or don't like about the underlyings that are being offered to them. I can answer that question for Ben, actually. So um, the new valuations model for crypto are obviously a lot different from, say, your usual uh, valuations for equities, for instance. Um, I think, uh, you know, you usually have your price to book ratio, your price to earnings ratio. Those are going out of the door for, crypt for, for you know, coins like Bitcoin for you know cryptocurrencies like bitcoin uh there are a few valuation models that are starting to take root and these are really really early really early in the infancy um some sites for it i think it's very um telling that the the firm called skew was recently acquired by coinbase also because they provide uh, you know analytics relating to cryptocurrencies so those are new model those are they have new and you know existing uh, existing traditional and new models for um you know va valuing cri crypto for instance one thing that's been the most popular i found in the market in researching valuations of cryptocurrencies is that some of them actually track social uh, media uh, mentions so the these are, you know, part of the valuations for crypto. So uh, a site, for example, like Luna Crush, for instance, uh, sentiment that is spelled with uh, S-A-N-T-I-M-E-T, -E for those of you who are interested, these track, you know, basically um, uh, the volume of social media posts, uh, influencers, and I, I 
presumably that includes people like Elon Musk, these fit, feed, feed into crypto prices and have a, you know, like mild to moderate uh, strength in sort of predicting the, the, the next crypto, um, you know, like trial or peak, for instance. So these are still in its infancy, it's still developing. And who knows, in, in maybe a year and a half or two years, we'll see like more of these firms offering, uh, you know, data analytics on, you know, uh, you know, sentiment. My firm actually came up with various valuation uh, methodologies back at the start of 2018 for Bitcoin. Uh, we came up with four cost of production, store of value, uh, foreign currency reserve, and as a means of payments. We actually came up with four mathematical models to do this. Uh, co cost of production was in there as well. Um, cost of production plus, so cost plus model too. So you take a miner, for example, you look at the cost of mining machines, electricity costs, average BTC mined, uh, you take the real estate space, you add a margin on what kind of cost does it need to achieve in order for that activity of mining to be profitable, otherwise you would never do it. So there's all these methodologies, but still they, they came through with something interesting, which was not the current valuation. <laughs> I think that uh, the other side of it is you mentioned around social media, because what you're finding is even in the world of social media, it's very much not limited to uh, crypto. Retail investors are like firing away on anything social media related. GameStop was the big, big example of that, of the influence of non-fundamental valuation methodologies on things that should have a fundamental anchor. And as people said, to the moon and shoot for the stars and People were getting in at GameStop at the top of that bubble. You can imagine just how shafted they got when people said, well, no, it's not worth that. And I need to anchor it and its PE is through the roof and it doesn't make any sense anymore. That's, it's an interesting dynamic how this is gonna play out. This is why I think that an anchor point around a security token is actually quite important. It shouldn't negatively impact liquidity. It will create what I would call a healthier investing environment as opposed to just pure speculation. Of course, everyone speculates. When you invest in a stock, you're speculating, but you're speculating with some facts. Right now, you're speculating with tweets and social media follows, which is a pure way to value something is frighteningly scary. Because now when people ask me, what is crypto worth? What is Bitcoin worth? I've been asked so many times, what's your call on it? And my answer is, it's whatever you think it's worth. And then someone said that doesn't make any sense. And I go, it makes 100% sense because that is the valuation of whatever has no fundamental underlying values, whatever you're prepared to pay for it and whatever someone will sell it to you for. That's it. So we got to work out how that momentum is going to play out in the market. It, it will appeal to retail, but as more institutions get in, will they ride with this just rampant social media, let valuations be whatever? That's when fiduciary responsibility starts to set in and they need to anchor it back to what I would call some kind of a fundamental, which then opens up the door for proper securities, right? As opposed to just open-ended casino. Absolutely. And I think that that's true of a lot of people as well, right? I mean, don't forget the crypto markets are still in their infancy. There are obviously a lot of people who are very active. Volume in crypto is like nothing the world has ever seen before. The total size of the market today is what, about $2 trillion. That's not even the size of Apple. So I think we've got a long way to go. And my personal uh, and Fusang's interest in digital securities is that, you know, what we've looked at, what the crypto markets have touched so far is a tiny sliver of world assets. The other 99% of assets out there, the buildings we sit in, the companies we work for, all of that is still waiting to be digitized. And I think that as more and more real world assets come online, just in a new technology package or a wrapper, that's when a lot of people, not just institutions, but you know, the average investor who's thinking about deploying their life savings, not just trading on the margin for a bit of fun, but who is putting their kids' college funds into investments, I think that's when they'll start coming into the market. And that's when I think we'll start to see a maturing the market and some really interesting things happen. Um, if anyone has any question, I see some people have actually typed comments, but only to the panelists, uh, so no one else can see it. Um, but 
well, actually, already we started running over slightly and wanted to give a brief plug about what Fusang is doing, because uh, we, Fusang, have always believed strongly not only in digital securities, but in what I call stakeholder capitalism, which is we got to eat our own cooking. If we say we're going to do something, we need to be aligned around it. Uh, and that's why we ourselves have digitized 100% of our own company's equity. And that's why we are going ahead and doing a digital IPO for our own shares. I think it would just be incredibly strange if we said, hey, we as a company think we're worth a huge amount of money because digital securities are the future, but we're not going to go and issue one. Right? I think people can very transparently see through that. And yes, we as employees, founders, stakeholders all have lockup periods for that IPL. <laughs> So we will be holding it for some time to come. And I think uh, one of my colleagues has very helpfully uh, put a thing in the chat to talk about uh, a group in the Fusang community. They were talking about the start of this call. Uh, you can just go type community.fusang.co or go to your app store and search for Fusang. Download our community app. There's an FSC show. There's group in there where we can talk obviously a bit about our own IPO, but also just in general about why we think digital securities are exciting and why, as I said, I think a lot of these ICOs should start to convert or at least start to think about them as a hybrid model and say, yes, ICOs and these utility token powered value networks have a huge amount of interest and there is a lot of space for them to operate but they need to be anchored by something fundamental, as you say, Ben, some kind of real valuation that you can point to so that all of us can start to invest real money in this asset class, as opposed to just trading for fun. Yeah. Any last Every, words, Ben, Stella? Yeah. No, I mean, like it's, I said it two weeks ago, everyone will call me a, an idiot and I don't know what I'm talking <laughs> about and I'm so stupid and I don't support the ecosystem and you couldn't be further from the truth. My view is like just, anchor something in, in fundamental value, right? At the end of the day, you're all happy and hoorah when the market goes north, but we've seen it go south. I've seen people lose their life savings in this because, and then they go back and say, well, why did it collapse so much? I had people when I made the call about the market falling in 2018 by about 90%, that they came and said, they were actually attacking me privately. And these were my friends. Like, and I was thinking, what, what do you want me to say? You know, you, you've lost 90% of your money and your argument to me for why that wasn't going to happen is, and there's just no logical response. And I said, what did you base it? What do you base your valuation on? And the gyrations that are happening within this ecosystem are frightening. I've never seen another asset class with A, this much volatility and B, with this much of a spread in terms of forecast value. You know, you have some of the biggest personalities in the world saying it's worth zero and people saying it's worth a million. Find me any other asset class in the entire world that, that, that gets that much of a spread in terms of forecast price. This is what I mean by forget fundamentals. It's just whatever you think it's worth when it comes to pure crypto crypto. And that is why I think it's healthy if we ever want to see proper institutionalization of this ecosystem to come back to some fundamental anchor point, which is where securities come in, which is where a regulated proper security comes in. And even if you look at all the crypto hedge funds right now, no one is saying like, I'm just long on a strategy that's 80% BTC, 20% Ethereum. These companies are making a fortune from inefficiencies in the market discrepancies between price, arbitrage opportunities. It's not about some long-term fundamental strategy. It's picking up on inefficiencies and capitalizing on that. Absolutely. Now, uh, yeah, there is a place for it, but again, I've never met a fundamental long only crypto hedge fund. Find me that and then I'll invest, right? But there's <laughs> no such thing. <laughs> Absolutely. What's that? Micro strategy maybe. Yeah, I mean, sure, but like all of these things, again, I'm, I'm just the kind of person that needs someone to explain something to me. If you can explain something to me and anchor it back to facts, I'm all for it. But if you come to me and sell me some BS on nothing, then I think you're full of, full of it. And at the end of the day, all the times in human history that we've seen this happen, 
we've just repeated the same thing over and over and over, which is why I'm very bullish on the security token ecosystem evolving, because all the benefits that blockchain can deliver, all the benefits that the crypto ecosystem can deliver can still be done within traditional financial market asset classes, but doing it in a way that brings our typical investment processes to the next level, the 2.0, the 3.0. It's not just about the, the isolated crypto gambling mentality out there. There will always be a place for that that will never disappear. But what I would say is if you want the real smart money, the institutional money in and people that are prepared to put major bets on from a fiduciary perspective, that ecosystem has to evolve. Otherwise, it's going to be crippled and limited in its current form. But I just want to say, add something else to uh, the ecosystem. As, as much as this needs to also evolve, we are at the mercy of the blockchain uh, bottleneck as well. So mm -hmm. there are still limitations on what the blockchain can or cannot do. Correct. It has promises of what it can do. And right now, the throughput of blockchain uh, is only a fraction of what the traditional markets can offer. It's the yeah. technology is not stable enough. Coding on the blockchain is not at a stage where it can process it can process a, a significant or you know critical mass of let's say trades per second uh, mm -hmm. and what and where we're looking at and how it can you know store the information. We haven't even got past the mm -hmm. um, the the challenge of people people losing their keys, managing their keys. What happens? You lose your key and you lose like your entire fortune. So what are you going to do? It's store, print it out and store it in your drawer. That's going back to the stone ages, right? So absolutely. Yeah, I saw this funny ad about this new uh, cold wallet and it was just like post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> it is like, write, write your private key here. And I went, mm, it's nice. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of capacity issues uh, associated with um, blockchain as a technology that don't exist in traditional financial markets. So what you're trying to do is find the convergence between two sides. And we're at, a, I guess, a turning point where you can kind of take the best of both worlds. And what you're seeing is experimentation in the market where people are trying to take the best of both worlds, such as the discussion for today's topic, but then finding out it screws up because you're not taking the best of both worlds. You're not really getting the point of what you're supposed to do here. And there is trial and error. There's a lot of learning process around this, but it's exciting. It's, it's really exciting to see how this ecosystem is shaping up. And I think it's going to move in leaps and bounds in the next year or two, uh, particularly as institutions put their money where their mouth is because their end investors are saying, get me in and get me in the right way. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. And obviously, Fusang is working hard to fulfill that promise. And, you know, to me, the most important thing is always orienting around what exactly does this deliver to customers, right? How does this make people's lives better, as opposed to just pure speculation? Anyway, uh, we've run way over time. And so thank you very much, to Stella, and thank to Ben uh, for the session. I think it's been fantastic. Um, if any of you on the call are interested in continuing the conversation, go join the community and all the links that we've posted up there. We'd love to hear your feedback. Come post. You can find me, I think all of us in the community, search for our names and send me a message. We'd love to hear your thoughts, feedbacks, arguments. If you disagree with us, come send us a post. Uh, and likewise, if you're interested in learning more about how Kusang is trying to create these digital securities and trying to do something for real in the market, come look us up in that community or look at some of the links that my team is pasting. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, Henry.